well, well, how many how many million they got? Okay, and and how many million do they need? That's a big difference. Well, what are they supposed to do? Find the difference and take it. Where? Uh huh. Okay, that's not really an actual plan. Yeah. December 16th, 1944. They're down and out. They're on their last legs. It's just a question of time until they collapse. That's what the Allies in the West say about the Germans. Until today. Now they've stopped saying it, because today, the Germans launch a massive offensive through the Ardennes. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Japanese established a corridor through China to Indochina. And in the Philippines, they continued kamikaze attacks. In Europe, the Allies reached the Ruhr River in force, though they couldn't take or damage its dams. Ravenna was liberated, the Soviets advanced in Hungary and set up a new government there, and a deadly demonstration led to serious fighting in Athens. I said I'd backtrack to cover that last more, so here goes. The first ELAS attack was at 4.30 a.m. the 4th against the local headquarters of the collaborationist organization X. ELAS is the military arm of EAM, the National Liberation Front. At 4.50 a.m., Winston Churchill sent the telegram I mentioned last week to use violence, and at 4.50, the British joined the fight against ELAS. There are 4,000 or so British forces in Athens and Piraeus, and 10,000 or so various Greek government forces. Elas on December 4th had 11 or 12,000 men and women with 2,000 or so from the Peloponnese joining the fight on the 6th. The Elas partisan forces are fairly poorly equipped and they wear civilian clothes. Elas straight off calls off any thought of taking Athens and wants to 1. take and disarm the police stations, 2. take the prisons and hotels where collaborators are held and execute them, and three, dissolve Organization X. The communists and the non-communists in AOM have compromised in this, and neither they nor the British forces want or prepare for a long conflict. Still, Elas captured a prison the six and executed 38 collaborators, men of the gendarmerie. That same day, they also captured 19 of 23 police stations, mostly peacefully. A general attack that day, however, against Syntagma Square, the seat of the Greek government, turns Athens into a battlefield. A great many people blame the British for the escalation. Lincoln McVeigh, U.S. ambassador to Greece, wrote the eighth to President Roosevelt, the handling of this fanatically freedom-loving country as if it were composed of natives under the British Raj is what is the trouble. And Mr. Churchill's recent prohibition against the Greeks attempting a political solution at this time is only the latest of a long line of blunders. The defenders are better trained, fortified, and equipped, and unlike Elas, have heavy weapons. Elas also is not able to coordinate its units, but despite the active participation of the British, Iam, Elas, and KKE, the Communist Party, hesitate to attack them at first, as their aim is not a military victory, but a negotiated settlement. A new General Elas attack comes this week on the 10th, and on the 11th, Allied Mediterranean Forces Commander Harold Alexander arrives to see the situation firsthand. He wires Churchill that it is more serious than he thought. The 13th comes Elas' first and last large-scale attack against the British. Its failure stabilizes the front through the end of the week. There are major operations both ending and beginning elsewhere in Europe. A few weeks ago, I talked about George Patton's Third Army, U.S. Third Army, finally taking Metz after nearly two months of trying, though not taking all of the forts around it. The last one to fall, Fort Jeanne d'Arc, does so this week on the 13th. Patton's left wing by now has really closed on the Saar River, but his right hasn't, and he certainly hasn't reached the Rhine and the Siegfried Line. Operation Queen ends today, the 16th. We've seen this over the past month, the big U.S. 1st and 9th Army attempts to reach and secure the Ruhr River, which would be a staging point for a thrust across the Rhine and into Germany. 
The Roe River dams are also a real objective, since if not taken, they could be flooded and cut off anyone who advances too far. The fighting has been very bloody, but it has not been an Allied success. 7th Corps from 1st Army doesn't even reach the Ruhr till now, meaning it's taken 31 days to advance 11 kilometers, which is just under 15 meters per hour. To make any and all advances, the two armies have taken 38,000 casualties. And there's this. In the three months since Staff Sergeant Holzinger became the first GI to set foot on German soil, the Allies had nowhere penetrated the border by more than 22 miles. Total American losses for the fall. Killed, wounded, died of wounds, died of illness, died in accidents, missing, captured, sick, injured, battle fatigued, imprisoned, suicides, climbed to 140,000. And they still can't actually cross the Ruhr. They don't even have a bridgehead. They've destroyed some German towns, sure, and captured an awful lot of Germans in that time, like, like 100,000. But the Germans still even hold a few points west of the river. And on top of that, without knowing that the Germans have been preparing a massive counteroffensive, Allied planners don't think that they could now make any attack into German territory until mid-January. Well, like I said, Operation Queen ends today and ends immediately because today, December 16th, is the day that the big German counteroffensive through the Ardennes begins. Already the morning of the 11th, Adolf Hitler and his entourage arrive at Alderhorst, his field headquarters for the West. Later that afternoon, Commander in the West Gerd von Rundstedt and Army Group B Commander Walter Model and senior officers arrive on the scene, and that evening, Hitler reveals the plans for Operation Herbstnebel, Autumn Mist. I have mentioned the basic plan before, but the idea is a thrust through the Ardennes, which will, in theory, cross the Meuse River bridges and take Antwerp, cutting off Bernard Montgomery's 21st Army Group to the north so it can be destroyed. See, Hitler thinks that, comparatively, destroying, say, 30 out of 500 or so divisions in the east wouldn't be decisive, but 30 of them in the west is a big enough chunk of enemy force that Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt would have to sue for peace. Rundstedt is in overall command, and it was he who led the successful German Ardennes Offensive in 1940. However, he had more than twice the force then, more fuel, more ammo, and heavy aerial support, which now he won't really have much of at all, and he does not think they can reach Antwerp. Model, whose army group is most of the attacking force, also doesn't believe in the big plan and neither do the Panzer Army commanders who will be in the field, Hasso von Manteuffel and Sepp Dietrich. Hitler has brushed aside all objections. Three armies will attack along a 150-kilometer front in two waves. Wave one is 200,000 men, 20 divisions, with 2,000 big guns and close to 1,000 tanks and self-propelled guns. Wave two, five divisions and hundreds more tanks will follow, and while they're all rampaging, the much beleaguered 15th Army will tie down the Americans around Aachen. The Ardennes is rugged territory to cross, to be sure, but there are 10 heavy roads through it, and the Germans have been through it twice before, to everyone's surprise, in 1914 and in 1940. Dietrich's 6th Panzer Army is to run lead, with nine divisions and some 120,000 men, breaking into Belgium, then advancing along heavy roads to the Meuse before Liège, then making for Antwerp. That's on the right. On the left, the seven divisions of Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army will act as a shield for Dietrich, heading through Luxembourg and southern Belgium, and preventing a counterattack from the southwest. Erich Brandenburger's 7th Army is on the far left to prevent a counterattack from the south. There are possible issues other than terrain and December weather before the start. Model thinks he'll need 32 million liters of gas to reach Antwerp, and he's been delivered just over 11 million so far and told that he'll have to capture some of his fuel needs. But the secrecy and deception have been completely successful, and the Allies do not see this coming. The launch date has been pushed back a couple of times, but it goes off now on the 16th, Beethoven's birthday. Bad weather has been predicted for the coming week, which will negate Allied aerial superiority. But wait, 
how do the Allies not know that this is coming? They knew in September that six Panzer Army had been created. They knew that Hitler was trying to raise a million men for fighting in the West. More recently, in fact, in early December, intelligence reported 200 troop transport trains moving to the front. They intercepted an enemy order for recon on the Meuse River bridges, which is a weird thing to recon if you're trying to just defend Germany. There's even been a rumor floating around of German plans to capture Antwerp. But Allied intelligence says it's not possible. Bernard Montgomery writes the 15th that the Germans cannot stage major operations. They all firmly believe that the Germans do not have the strength left to mount a major offensive. They just can't do it. I mean, Six Panzer Army is the last mobile reserve the Germans have in the West, and no commander, surely not the prudent Rundstedt, is going to risk losing that in a winter offensive, right? Since we wouldn't do something crazy like that, then surely they wouldn't do something crazy like that. But the Allies are not aware that it is not Rundstedt directing the field armies, it is Adolf Hitler. And that is a horse of a different color. Okay, there are those that are suspicious and concerned. Allied Supreme Commander Dwight Eisenhower's intelligence chief Ken Strong said a couple weeks ago that six Panzer Army maybe could attack through the Ardennes. And he even told 12th Army Group Commander Omar Bradley about this, but Bradley wasn't really convinced. And also, Patton and his 3rd Army Intelligence Officer, General Oscar W. Koch, sensed what others did not, that a dangerous, desperate enemy remained capable of wreaking havoc. Koch insisted that the German reversal in recent months has not been a rout or a mass collapse. On December 7th, he noted a large panzer concentration west of the Rhine in the northern portion of 12th Army Group's zone of advance. Two days later, he pointed out the vulnerability of 8th Corps in the Ardennes. On December 14th, Koch cited the persistent mystery over the location of at least 14 German divisions, most of them armored, which together could spearhead an armored offensive. George Patton even writes in his diary, what a mistake 1st Army is making by leaving 8th Corps static since it's likely that the Germans are building up east of them. And they are. And at 5.30 this morning, the 16th, the opening barrage begins. First SS Panzer Corps from 6th Panzer Army is to make a quick breakthrough of the Elsenborn Ridge, which will crack open the front for the armor to drive through to the Meuse. Defending in that sector are five battalions of the U.S. 99th Division. That's it. On the forward slopes of the ridge lie the twin villages of Rosherath Krinkelt, and the first attacks are in the forest in front of that, which the Americans surprisingly managed to hold off this day. In general, the whole 6th Panzer Army assault stalls today against 2nd and 99th Divisions. The sun sets already at 4.35 in the afternoon. 40 kilometers to the south, 5th Panzer Army begins from across the river Ur. 2nd Panzer Division has 86 tanks. 26th Volksgrenadier Division has 17,000 men and is battle-hardened, though neither has much mechanized transport. And the Panzer Lehr Division, the 3rd Assault Division, is well experienced, but hasn't fully recovered from fighting last month. Most important, such was the German material poverty at this stage of the war, that although 5th Panzer Army held a formidable qualitative and quantitative edge in equipment, it lacked good bridging equipment for spanning the ore, until its engineers manhandled pontoons down narrow, slippery roads and fastened them into place. The infantry of 26 VGD would have to carry the fight alone without supporting heavy weapons or tanks. Well, this day, the American left holds back the two divisions of 58th Panzer Corps. The right is facing the badly equipped and undermanned German 7th Army and makes an orderly fighting withdrawal. But the center, that's the 110th Regiment of the 28th Division. They face those three assault divisions along a 40 kilometer front. They hold roadblocks in Marnach and Hosingen, which have the best roads to eventually reach the local hub, Baston. Manteuffel orders Marnach and Hosingen taken by direct assault. 
Though as a general order, his men are to rapidly infiltrate and bypass to maintain speed. This day, though, does not go well for the Germans here either, and the one-tenth only loses a few defended positions, like Marnach. Hoisingen holds all day. The bridge-laying problems, poor roads, lack of armor, terrain, and weather are already making the attackers fall behind schedule. The Germans do have success in the 12-kilometer-wide Losham Gap, however. The boundary between U.S. 5th and 8th Corps is in the middle of the gap, meaning that you could stand at the boundary and talk to another soldier, but your chain of command is separated by 150 kilometers. The 14th Cavalry Group is assigned here, but it's a static position, so they have no mobility, and by the end of the day, the American positions are crumbling. That's one German pincer. The other is advancing south of the Schnee Eiffel. If they link up, they'll surround its defenders, unaware of the danger, on the high ground there. Alan Jones, commanding the 106 Division, is aware of his regiment's danger, and he calls 8th Corps Commander Troy Middleton as night falls to ask to withdraw them. The phone line is unsecured, and they're worried about enemy eavesdroppers, so they talk in riddles and code words, with the result that, after the call, Middleton thinks he's told Jones to withdraw, and Jones thinks he's been told to hold position. That confusion might not end well. The events of the day have confused American high command in general, with most thinking these to be to be spoiler attacks until later in the afternoon. Eisenhower releases 7th and 10th armored divisions from the reserve in the evening to go help Middleton, but the situation doesn't seem especially grave in general. As for the Germans, they have not achieved the expected breakthrough, but they do now know the enemy's weaknesses, and they have either captured or built bridges. So the Panzers are now ready to roll, particularly the 1st SS Panzer Division, the tip of the spear under Joachim Piper, is ready to strike. It's Allied attacks going off this week in Italy and Hungary. British 8th Army attacks are still in progress in Italy, and on the 10th, both the 2nd New Zealand and the 10th Indian Divisions crossed the Lamone. Then that night, the Canadian 1st Infantry and 5th Armoured Divisions also crossed between Alphonsine and Banya Cavallo, surprising the Germans. But they can't advance much further, and their attacks stop the 14th and 15th. Further attempts to take Banya Cavallo also fail. By today, though, the 43rd Gurkha Brigade has finally cleared Faenza, and 10th Indian Division has reached the Senio River. The Soviets are still grinding their way towards Budapest, and also grinding their way towards surrounding it and cutting it off. 46th Army has been trying to complete the Western Encirclement, but it's obvious by this week that it's not strong enough to do so on its own. So on the 12th, Stavka gives the job to the whole right flank of Fyodor Tolbukhin's 3rd Ukrainian Front, to which 46 has been assigned. Actually, that Stavka directive does more than just that. It assigns how the whole encirclement of Budapest is supposed to go. Tolbukhin, in general, is to attack north from Lake Velence, aiming to reach the south bank of the Danube up near Estergom, which would cut off any enemy escape to the west but his right is to attack towards Budapest, working together with Rodion Malinovsky's 2nd Ukrainian Front to reach it. Malinovsky's orders are to hold down the enemy in Pest, east of the Danube, but the three armies on his right, two Soviet and one Romanian, are to make a wide flanking maneuver around Budapest, hopefully all the way around to the Nitra River. North of the city, where the Danube bends around to the west, he's got three more armies to make concentric attacks, which together with Tolbukhin should cut the city off. German Army Group South Commander Johannes Friesner is to defend this, especially at Shahi, by bringing over a panzer division from Budapest and bringing in the Dörlewanger Brigade, who have just finished fighting partisans in Slovakia. There is this, though. The Dierlewanger Brigade had six full-strength battalions. The concentration camps gave it a more than ample replacement pool, but committing it at the front was risky. Part of its troops were German communists, and all were considerably less than dedicated soldiers of the Reich. The officers were roughnecks and sadists, impromptu executioners rather than tacticians. Yep, 
So on the 14th, one of those battalion commanders just puts up a thin defense line instead of using the whole battalion, and the Soviets take Shahi. But this may very well not have been that commander's fault. On the 15th, a whole company of communists desert, and by the end of the week, the whole brigade is at a small-scale mutiny with both more desertions and troops shooting their officers. It's not just the Germans in Hungary who don't want to be trapped. The Japanese in Burma sure don't either. Okay, back in November, Bill Slim sent five divisions of his British 14th Army across the Chinwin River to chase down and defeat the Japanese Burma Area Army on the Shwebo Plain. Thing is, Burma Area Army Commander Haitaro Kimura has no intention of allowing his 20,000 or so man-strong force to be trapped anywhere west of the Irrawaddy River. So he's got his 28th Army defending Arakan, which has tricky terrain for any attacker to overcome, and his 15th Army has been pulling back with a few rear guards on the plain, buying them time. The idea is to overstretch and sabotage the Allied supply lines, which could maybe lead to the possibility of a counterattack. Kimura does face serious obstacles. He's got a few dozen planes versus over 1,200 Allied ones, and his 14th tank regiment by now has only around 20 tanks. Slim figured out that the Japanese were not going to really fight on the plane, and so he changed plans. So Indian 33rd Corps is going to clear the plane and head for Mandalay, but 4th Corps is now heading south on a march of over 300 kilometers to eventually cross the Irrawaddy at Pakoku and take Mektila. Doing this would cut off Japanese supplies going up to Mandalay, cut off Kimura's retreat, and, and be the anvil that Japanese 15th Army would be crushed on by 33rd Corps' frontal assault. The trick is, you have to convince the Japanese that 4th Corps is also advancing on Mandalay, so they've set up a dummy headquarters near Sitong through which they are relaying radio traffic. So things are all in motion for what looks like serious fighting over the next couple of months. The serious fighting we've seen in the Philippines for nearly two months continues this week. On the 10th, on Leyte, U.S. 77th Division attacks Ormok and takes it by the end of the day. But the Japanese have a defense system between the town and the highway heading north up the Ormok Valley. This proves too tough to immediately take, and the division has left its tanks on Guam. But on the 13th and the 14th, constant attacks against the blockhouse that is the center of the defense system finally overcome it, and today the 16th, Kogon Falls, and with it the road junction. The highway north is open. American landings on Mindoro go off the 15th. It is the 21st Regiment of the 24th Division and the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment that are the ground forces. They're using the same landing craft that were used last week near Ormok and have local protection from 12 destroyers and a cruiser, a covering force of three more cruisers and seven more destroyers, and further off in the Sulu Sea, three battleships, three cruisers, 18 destroyers, and six escort carriers. This is Tom Kincaid's 7th Fleet. George Kenney's land base Air Force's planes on Leyte are providing aerial support from there, and the planes from those escort carriers will fill in when weather or night prevent the land-based planes from flying. To the north is the fast carrier fleet. Just coming off 10 days of repair and rest at Ulithi, they are in three task groups now and have replaced a lot of bombers with fighters to counter the kamikaze menace. They've also set up a sort of destroyer radar net and combat air patrol 100 kilometers ahead of the fleet to help with that as well. The 14th to the 16th come three days of airstrikes on Luzon, with the main purpose being keeping fighters over the Luzon airfields so Japanese planes cannot take off. This is called Big Blue Blanket, and yeah, it destroys over 200 enemy planes on the ground, but importantly, suppresses attacks on the Mindoro-bound shipping. On the 13th, though, kamikazes knock a cruiser and a destroyer out of action. The actual landings on Mindoro are unopposed, and they start getting airfields ready right away. And that is the week. Allied advances in Hungary and Italy, but everything stopping on the Western Front 
once the Germans began their huge Ardennes offensive. Fighting on Leyte and landings on Mindoro. Also, the Palawan massacre happens the 14th, and you can learn about that on our Instagram day-by-day -day coverage of the war, which you can also find under the community tab here. And on the 15th, big band star Glenn Miller disappears when his plane goes missing. Miller is an enormous star, with 69 top 10 hits in just four years, which is more than Elvis Presley, whoever that is, will have in his career. You can also learn more about that on our Insta for that particular day. So, here it is, the big German attack, that most everyone said should not be possible, yet here it is. And through the Ardennes, once again, which is poorly defended, once again. It's only been one day, so who knows what will happen, but you know, if they do somehow reach the Meuse and Antwerp, and they do have surprise, and somehow do cut off Monty's army group, then what would the Allies do? Maybe that scenario shouldn't be possible, but then again, neither was today's offensive, right? Anything is possible in modern war. If you want to see serious events that very nearly led to an even more modern war, you can click right here for the beginning of our Cuba Crisis Day-by-Day -day series. And join the Time Ghost Army to get ever more series like that one, this one, and the ones we have planned for the future. John Bava is the Army Member of the Week. These are the newest commissioned officers, and you can join at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe, and I will see you next time. Music